You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi, my name is Johanna and I'm currently in a small town 90 minutes north of Vienna, here where Fuchs und Hase sich Gute Nacht sagen. I'm Annie from Boston and we're very excited to have you back for the second part of the Galapagos Affair. But what is that about Fuchs and, ha- Fuchs and Haas, where Fox and Hare say goodnight? Yes, yes, it means a very rural, isolated area, far away from civilization and uh, even the animals here can do nothing else but tell each other, sleep well, we're not going to eat each other tonight. <laughs> that sounds, honestly, that's kind of the dream, right? It's That sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was the German saying for today. Uh, we have more urgent German things to discuss now, I'd say, because we left our two nude German misanthropes, Friedrich and Dore, last week on Floriana. Annie, you want to give us a quick recap? I do. Yes. And for those of you who haven't listened to part one of this case, please stop now and go back to episode 77 so that you'll know everything that's going on. And for everyone else, I'm going to tell you what's happened so far. And I also want to let you know that this is the first time I'm recording Home Alone with the Puppy. So if you hear him chewing on his chew toys, sorry about that. But fingers crossed. All right. So let's get back into what happened last week, because this story is something else. It's 1929, and the doctor or dentist, Friedrich Ritter, and his very special lady friend, the teacher, Dora Strauch, who was suffering from MS, they divorced their spouses, and they moved to the isolated and uninhabited island of Floriana in the Galapagos. He pulled all his teeth out prophylactically, and they waited until hers started to rot before he pulled her teeth out too, with gardening tools, because they were the sort of folks who were not really pro-teeth retention. Because if they were the sort of folks who were pro-teeth retention, we probably wouldn't be talking about them. But in any case, they lived there happily, miserable, and without teeth, but with shared metal dentures, allegedly, and gladly accepted gifts from passing ships. They spent their days with hard labor and their evenings with writing and dancing with donkeys. They lived their best neighborless lives in Frido, their settlement, until one day, more settlers came to Floriana. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> yes, and this is where we left them last week. So it's 28th of August, 1932, and the schooner was approaching Black Beach. And to Friedrichs and Dora's shock, what the schooner brought to the island were new neighbors. Rather than all the gifts you were hoping for, can you imagine? <laughs> you're just thinking all of a sudden, you're like, oh, a ship's here. We're mm. going to get some soap and lamp oil. And instead you get people. <laughs> It's the family Wittmer from Cologne. The Wittmers, that's Heinz, his wife Margaret, and their 14-year-old son, Harry, from Heinz's first marriage. In fact, Heinz and Margaret, who was 14 years younger than her husband, they had just been married for a little over a year. Margaret was also five months pregnant. And can I just say that this is exactly what would happen to me? (laughs) I would move to an isolated, uninhabited island in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden a family would show up, and soon enough, a baby would be living next door. Not that I hate children, I'm just very sensitive to screaming and crying. (laughs) So what you're saying is when we eventually are able to travel together, my evening tradition of crying down a wall is going to be annoying to you. (laughs) (laughs) So much. I'm going to go down to the bar in the meantime. On the plus side, the Wittmers also brought their two dogs. One of them was a German shepherd called Lum, and the other one was a dachshund. I would accept the baby if I were allowed to play with the dogs in return. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's reasonable, right? I agree. Yeah, I 100%. Yeah. Heinz Wittmer, who was born in 1891, had been working in the office of future German president Konrad Adenauer, who back then was still the mayor of Cologne. Fun fact, at the time of his election, Adenauer was the youngest mayor of Cologne and the youngest mayor of a major German city. Just pretty, pretty big. Yeah. We're not here to hear anything about Konrad Adenauer. We want to know why the Wittmers left Germany and decided to move to Floriana. First of all, their son Harry was suffering from some form of lung disease and also something with his eyes was a little bit wrong. Uh, So they thought that a change of climate would do him good. They also wanted to escape the Great Depression in Germany and 
I mean, it's possible, maybe Heinz was smart enough to already smell the upcoming war. He had read about modern day Adam and Eve and he decided to sell everything and to leave Germany and move his family to Floriana. And when the Wittmers set foot on Black Beach, they were not exactly happy. Heinz and Margaret stood silently next to each other because they had imagined the island completely differently. Not this shrubby, thorny wasteland. But what could they do? There was no going back now, even if they wanted. And even if there was a ship to take them back because they had barely any money left. I think they came to Floriana with like 20 German mark. Now you might think... Why did the Whitmers choose Floriana as their new home and not like the other settlers who had followed Friedrichs and Dora's example and just moved to an island with an already established community? Well, Margaret had apparently thought that it would be great to live next door to a doctor who could help her deliver the baby, which... It makes total sense. Yeah, he could deliver it with gardening tools. But yeah, no, it, it does. It makes a lot of sense. And it's smart of Margaret to think that way. But there was, of course, one tiny problem that Margaret could never have anticipated. Friedrich Ritter. He was not willing to assist the pregnant woman in any way. But first things first, the family from Cologne makes their way over to Frido to meet Dora and Friedrich. So this happens. This family shows up at their door. And as Johanna said, Friedrich and Dora are shocked. They do not want other settlers on the island. They're okay with people passing by and visiting and leaving offers of chocolate and lamp oil. But then they're very glad whenever the (laughs) visitors leave again. And now they've got an entire family here, including a dog. And maybe Dora was a little bit happy about the dog? I mean, how could you not be? It's a dog, right? But she was very unhappy about the Whitmers, and Margaret in particular. If you remember, in episode one, we told you that Dora despised the middle-class bourgeois life of German housewives, and that's part of why she left to start a new life on a deserted island. And now the only other woman on this island with her was exactly that a middle-class, bourgeois, housewife, and pregnant on top of that. Why could the new neighbors not be some sort of intellectual, interesting couple, like the neighbors in Christmas Vacation? They could have at least have had scholarly (laughs) conversations with them. I don't know, (laughs) Margo. Sorry. I just thought when I imagine like an uptight, boring, horrible couple, I always imagine the Christmas Vacation neighbors. (laughs) But yeah, the Whitmers were practical people. They were willing to work hard and make the best of their new life. And how did the Whitmers react when they finally got to meet Friedrich and Dora after all the things they had read about them in articles? Well, Margaret was a little bit, let's say, surprised. In her book entitled Floriana, A Woman's Pilgrimage to the Galapagos, she writes, quote, Despite all I had heard, I had a slight shock when I first saw the former dentist from Berlin. Admittedly, I couldn't have expected an elegant figure in a white coat, and it was a relief to find that he was apparently no longer a nudist, for he was wearing trousers and a shirt. He was short and thick-set, with a mop of untidy black hair, above a deeply wrinkled brow, and a broad, flat nose in a triangular face, and a black mustache. Altogether, he looked rather frightening, and if I had been on my own, I might almost have fled. End quote. But Margaret admitted that she liked him more than Dory. When Dory shook Margaret's hand, she made a face as if she had just smelled poop and then asked the new arrival, aren't you a bit too well-dressed for the Galapagos? And then immediately started to discuss Nietzsche. So, (laughs) yeah. After they were done exchanging some forced small talk, Friedrich Ritter offered to take them to a perfect spot for them to settle down. And of course, he chose a spot far enough away from Frido. He took the Whitmer family to the three former pirate caves, and actually, the family was really thankful for finding shelter in those caves. They immediately started to make themselves comfortable, Margaret cleaned and tried to make the caves as cozy and comfortable as possible, and Heinz went hunting for pigs and cattle, the descendants of livestock from back in the 18th century, when the island had been used as a penal colony. And Heinz was a successful hunter. Pretty soon he came home with a pig and Margaret could start making hams and roasts. And guess what? Friedrich showed up to ask for some ham. It turned out his vegetarianism wasn't as much out of real moral conviction, but rather something he could use as another means to show his superiority and excuse to lecture people. Honestly, I don't even judge. Two and a half years on an island and suddenly you smell Schweinsbraten in the air. (laughs) I personally, I'd be like Tom, you know, the cat from Tom and Jerry. Mm -hmm. It's just floating through the air following the scent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I really like a grilled ham and cheese toasty. (laughs) There, I said it. 
All right. So as we mentioned, Friedrich was absolutely not willing to help Margaret during the last months of her pregnancy, uh, let alone with giving birth. And he was livid that anyone would think that he would ever serve as a doctor to anyone. Yeah, yeah. A doctor serving as a doctor. That audacity. Oh, I know. I'm still not 100% convinced he was actually a doctor of anything. I, I want to see his <laughs> transcripts. But yeah, who would expect the only doctor in a radius of several hundreds of miles to actually help people in need, right? But in the end, he did cave, and there'll be more on that later. Yes, because before the baby was born, something else happened. So the Wittmers and Dr. Ritter and Miss Strauch lived on the island, and I think they only had as much contact as needed, but otherwise the two groups just did stick to themselves. And then, one day in October, 15th of October 1932 to be exact, the Wittmers suddenly had visitors. Margaret looked out her cave when she saw a trio making their way towards her home. And what a trio it was. It was a woman riding on a donkey, a pistol stuck in her belt, and two young men following her on foot. <laughs> they stopped at the Wittmer's freshwater spring. The young men helped the woman off the donkey. One bent down to take her shoes off, and the woman, without any hesitation, stepped into the water and soaked her feet. In the spring, the Wittmer's used as their drinking water. <laughs> Who are these people. Exactly. <laughs> Who are these people? Well, it turned out that the newcomers were the Austrian Baroness Eloise Wagner de Busquet and her two German lovers Rudolf Lorenz and Robert Philipson. A real Baroness on this small unwelcoming island? Mm, probably not. So there are so many rumors and myths that surround Eloise and most rumors and myths were created by the blonde woman herself. One time she says that she is the daughter of a high-ranking Austrian government official who had been sent to the Middle East to supervise the construction of a railroad. Another time she states to have been a dancer in Istanbul, another time a World War I spy, uh, one time she was married to a French army pilot, she's the widowed wife of a French aristocrat, owner of a fashion boutique in, in Paris, and so on and so on. Uh, she claims to speak eight languages and that she is related to Franz Liszt and Richard Wagner. Hmm. <laughs> Most likely, none of this is actually true, and Eloise was just an imposter. She indeed had been the owner of a store named Antoinette in Paris, which is so creative. <laughs> I mean, who? Yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Together with Rudolf Lorenz, but they had managed to ruin their shop and now they had fled from creditors to Floriana. After washing her feet, she introduces herself and makes a huge announcement. She tells the Wittmers that she came to open a grand hotel for the European and American high society who passed the Galapagos Islands with their yachts and to turn Floriana into a second Miami. And for this plan, she did not only bring her two German lovers, calling Robert Philipson her architect and Rudolf Lorenz her engineer, but also her third beau, a man from Ecuador named Manuel Valdivieso. The three should build a posh hotel for the approximately 40-year-old Baroness. But the Ecuadorian men did run off pretty soon after. After meeting the Wittmers, the three made their way to Frido, where, without asking for permission and before properly introducing herself, Eloise sat down in one of the deck chairs and demanded to have a cup of tea. <laughs> Obviously, Dora and Friedrich were not amused, especially Dora. With Friedrich, mm, I'm not sure. That's just my opinion. I personally think that he only despised her in the beginning because he couldn't have her. Oh, yeah. He resented Dora for being very weak and sick, yes. right? Uh, Eloise was clearly a very strong woman with a certain assertiveness, so I'm almost certain that he had a bit of a crush on her, at least in the beginning. Yeah. But he did say about her, quote, I for one am disgusted by her theatricals. If she had a single proper man with her instead of a pair of serval gigolos, she could be kept in order without trouble, end quote. Promise me you will put that on my tombstone. Do you promise? <laughs> promise me. I promise. <laughs> but there also exists a photo of Friedrich and Eloise, and he has his arm on her hip, and they're looking at each other, both smiling. It looks like a pretty intimate moment between people who mm. know each other pretty well, I'd say. But, yeah. yeah. Who can say? I mean, this whole island soap opera is so confusing. For example, Heinz Wittmer did go to visit Dore Strauch yeah. every single Sunday. Why? Who knows? But Margaret was not pleased. It feels as if everybody was having some secrets on the island and there seems to have been several layers of jealousy. I mean, you're living on an island in the middle of nowhere. What's your wife going to do when she finds out you're cheating? Start swimming? Like feeding you to the sharks? <laughs> yeah. 
So Eloise, Rudolf and Robert decided to settle down in the Wittmer's garden. They had some kind of orange <laughs> grove next to their caves and without asking, Eloise stated that this would be the perfect spot to settle down until their hotel called Hacienda Paradiso would be completed. <laughs> Fucking nerve. Like, how dare I'm you? Below. <laughs> Honestly. So the two men start working on the hotel immediately. Ships bring in tools and building material. But to be honest, the Hacienda Paradiso will never be more than just two corrugated iron huts. <laughs> But that doesn't stop Eloise from advertising her grand luxury hotel all over. And she started to call herself the Empress of Galapagos and acted as if Floriana was her own private island and everybody living on it were either her slaves or subordinates. Yeah, it, this kind of reminds me a little bit of the Fry Festival. Like, <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Showing up, and it's just like a corrugated metal hut. <laughs> true, it's true, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, it obviously caused a lot of resentment on the island. And one day in November of 1932, so Eloise and her men hadn't even been on the island for two months yet, and Norwegian settlers from the nearby island of Santa Cruz came over to Floriana. So as we said, Floriana had livestock roaming the island, and it was customary that settlers from other islands would come over to hunt for meat. No problem at all. But this day, after the Norwegian man had shot a calf, when Eloise heard the shot, she came running, her rifle drawn, yelling at the men that they had just shot her calf, that everything on this island belonged to her. The Norwegian men fled the scene and ran over to Frido, where they told Friedrich about what had just happened. And of course, Friedrich was very upset when he heard that. Not because he felt bad for the settlers from Santa Cruz, I'm sure he couldn't have cared less, but how dare she call everything on Floriana her own? Who did she think she was? Friedrich wrote a letter to the governor of San Cristobal with an account of what had just occurred. But when the governor visited the island, he met with Eloise, sat down in her hut with her, and was absolutely smitten. So nothing came out of the complaint. Quite the contrary, he even gave her four square miles of land to build her hotel on. Hi. The Ritters and the Whitmers are granted some land too, 50 acres each. And he also declares that the Whitmers have to share their freshwater spring with Eloise and her men. So this is starting to sound like it'll be trouble. Yeah. And now it's the 30th of December, 1932, and Margaret starts to feel contractions, but she refuses to call for Dr. Ritter. After he showed not much interest in helping her, she was absolutely determined to manage the birth of her first child all by herself. In her book, she even tells the story of how she got up and baked a cake for New Year's. But after 72 hours, when the pain was growing worse, Worse and worse, she did finally ask her husband to go and get the doctor because she was afraid for her life. After more than three hours, Heinz returned and brought Friedrich with him. In the end, all was well, and the first settler was born on Floriana, Rolf Whitmer. To this day, there's a bust in the harbor of Floriana to honor him, and after Rolf's birth, a feeling of calm and peace came over Floriana. Friedrich, Dora, and Eloise came over to bring gifts for the newest Florianian. Florianian? Almost like the three wise men. Dory even noted that she hoped that from now on they could all live together in harmony. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that didn't last long. No, but first, an old acquaintance of ours makes an appearance. Shortly after Rolf was born, on 26th of January 1933, our old friend philanthropist, researcher, cello player, the Renaissance man and millionaire George Allen Hancock returned to Floriana on the Valero 3 on his annual research voyage to the Galapagos archipelago. <laughs> <laughs> So when the crew arrived, they found a strange sign written apparently with red lipstick. Ugh. That's so cliche. So Everything cl in this story is so cliche. It really is. <laughs> also, things written with red lipstick I find ominous. I just... Well, at least it's not blood. True. True. So the sign said, Hacienda Paradiso, two hours, marked road, and an arrow. And when they went to Frido, they learned that now a baroness was living on Floriana. Friedrich told Captain Hancock all about what had happened on the island since the Valero 3's last visit. And John Garth, who we already mentioned in part one, he was the entomologist on board, he noted, quote, There is now a baroness living on Floriana with several husbands and a machine gun, end quote. <laughs> and now, of course, Captain Hancock has to meet this strange baroness, so he asks Friedrich to show them to her home, which he does, and the crew is shocked when they see the camp of Eloise, Robert and Rudolf, because the huts are filthy and absolutely unsanitary. Apparently none of the three had any interest in cleaning and housekeeping, they were probably busy with all the sexy time going on. <laughs> Let's just be glad there were no black lights back then. 
Eloise, of course, is thrilled to meet the millionaire as he is exactly the clientele she wants for her luxury hotel. And afterwards, they also visit the Wittmers and John Garth is very impressed with the tidy home and notes what a great housewife Margaret seems to be. And then Captain Hancock, of course, invites all of the people living on Floriana over to the Valero 3. Big mistake. Huge. <laughs> Because Dore immediately tells Eloise what she thinks of her and her way of living, and the crew of the Valero 3 has their hands full by trying to keep all three groups separated for the rest of the evening. Yeah, so Dora's hope of living in peace and harmony with her neighbors was just immediately destroyed by Dora. And then it gets even worse. So, the next day, Captain Hancock handed over a bunch of gifts to Friedrich that he had brought for the two of them. Because he didn't know that in the meantime, more people had moved to Floriana, so he hadn't brought gifts for everyone. Although, in my opinion, I really think he could have divided the gifts after he saw that there are now three groups of people living on the island. Yep. But I agree. Yeah, right? But he didn't. And so, Friedrich loaded everything on their donkey and took the bounty home. When Eloise heard about it, she was fine with it. She was like, <laughs> you deserve it. No. She was so mad, and she ran over to Frido to demand the even distribution of the gifts among all of them. And Friedrich kicked her out. But it seems the gifts were what turned a feud between neighbors into something of a war. The Valero Three left on the 6th of February, 1933, but not without John Garth stating that he thinks that the Whitmers are the most successful to really live off the land and lead an independent life, and that he thinks that Friedrich and Dory are incapable of doing so because they've been spoiled through gifts by Hancock and others. I think he's right. I think if nobody would have ever come to support them, they would have needed to make it work somehow. Yeah, I agree completely. The Whitmers are like legit Swiss family Robinsoning out there. Yeah. Robinsoning? Is that a word? It is now. And the rest of them are just, they're not. They're just, no, I'm not judging. I would 100% be the person desperate for gifts. It's fine. But it is what it is. So after Hancock's departure, Baroness Wagner declares that Hancock was so impressed by her and her plans for the Hacienda Paradiso that he offered to make a pirate movie about her with the title The Empress of Floriana. Media gets wind of Eloise, and they start to write articles about her. And in October of 1933, George A. Hancock returns to Floriana and brings newspapers and magazines. And the articles in them paint an interesting picture. They talk about the Baroness running around almost naked, but with her gun and a whip, that she whips her lovers if they don't obey her. And the article even says that she had Friedrich Ritter arrested and put him in shackles. <laughs> And in January of 1934, the Valero 3 returns again to Floriana to start filming the movie The Empress of Floriana. Yeah, that's right. Did you think she was going to, like, lying to sound important? Because she wasn't. <laughs> she wasn't. They really... This is a thing. I can't believe this is a thing. Like, she lied that's about so, so much stuff, right? So, like, I would never... I, me too, when I was reading that, I was like, oh my god, she wasn't even lying. <laughs> That's the thing. That's how you end up with a fire festival, right? Because it's like, some of it's true. So how if you verify one thing, the rest of it must be all right, right? Sure, it's fine. True. So the whole ship crew had to get involved. So some were helping in the filming process while others had to play roles. Eloise played a pirate version of herself, which I think is not too far-fetched because in real life, she did like to withhold goods that belonged to other settlers and try to sell it back to them at a very high cost. She was such a bitch. And if you watch the 2013 documentary The Galapagos Affair, Satan Came to Eden, you can see parts of this silent movie and it's everything you imagine. It really is. The documentary was a great resource for us, by the way. Definitely go and check it out. So, the plot was thought out by Eloise and Captain Hancock. The opening card reads, because it's a silent, silent movie, of course. Yeah. So the opening card reads, quote, On the shores of a desert island, a honeymooning couple find themselves shipwrecked and stranded, end quote. So the wife is almost dying of thirst, and so the husband sets out to find water. Okay, so next you see pirate Eloise and her companion, Robert Philipson. Philipson wants some sexy time, but pirate Eloise is in no mood for such nonsense, and the card reads, quote, theirs is not a happy household, end quote. It's all very traumatic. <laughs> so first pirate Eloise shots the newlywed wife, then the newlywed husband has to shoot Philipson, and in the end the newlywed husband and pirate Eloise, they have sexy time in their happy home. <laughs> I think the fact that only Philipson was starring in this movie also shows that there was some sort of tension going on in their menage a trois, uh. in their thruple. 
wasn't doing great. Rudolf Lorenz was was indeed more of a whipping boy for Eloise and Robert. She really mistreated him, and he had to do all of the chores around the house and take care of all the animals, and he just had to absolutely obey her. And if not, he would get whipped, and Robert would often beat up the slender Rudolf. At one point, Rudolf even fled to Friedrich and Dory to hide from his two companions and to complain about them. And that's when he confided that Eloise was not really a baroness. <gasps> Shocker. I know. Rudolf Lorenz had met Eloise in Paris. She was living with her husband, a man named Bosquet. Rudolf and Eloise opened a boutique together, and of course, with Rudolf's money. Soon, they hired Robert Philipson as a clerk. Now, she was indeed running from people she owed money to after her business in Paris had failed, and apparently one of the reasons for her to come to Floriana was a pirate treasure that was rumored to be hidden on the island. This story has just everything. So in March 1934, there was a drought. It was unbearably hot. The freshwater springs on the island were not producing enough water and the inhabitants of the island kept praying and hoping for the long overdue rain. But it didn't come. It was hard for Frido. It was hard for the Wittmer home. But it was way worse for the Hacienda Paradiso. The plants in the garden died. There was no food. There was barely any water. And Eloise, Rudolf and Robert seemed to lack the knowledge of how to best handle the situation as they also had already run out of all their supplies. Also, no yachts were coming, so no more supplies and no more gifts. And this leads to an even more horrible situation in the love triangle. Rudolf Lorenz is getting beaten up worse than ever and he starts fearing for his life. And he seeks refuge in Frido, but Dora and Friedrich refuse to take him in because they are too scared of Eloise. So he finds shelter with the Wittmers. But Eloise goes over there daily asking for him and Rudolf gets soft every time and returns to the hacienda with her, only to flee again shortly after. Rudolf Lorenz knows he needs to escape the island. And not only Rudolf is fed up with the whole situation. During a conversation with Friedrich and Dore, Heinz Wittmer exclaims that they have to find a solution for the situation with Eloise. The governor will not help them, so they need to take matters in their own hands. It sounds a lot like everything is now spiraling and a violent end is near. And that's because it was. On one very hot day in the middle of March, Dora and Friedrich are resting on their porch when all of a sudden... They hear a horrible, blood-curdling scream of a woman. And then nothing. Just silence. And the two start to believe that the unbearable heat has played a trick on their minds. But then, a few days later, Rudolph and Margaret are showing up in Frido, and Margaret tells them the weirdest story. She says that a couple of days ago, the Whitmers had heard visitors over at Hacienda Paradiso. A while later, Eloise had shown up at their house to ask for Rudolph, who was not there. She told her to tell Rudolph that friends of hers had arrived, and that she and Robert are leaving Floriana with them for Tahiti. She hoped that her plans for a hotel would be more feasible there. And then Eloise had turned around and left, just like that, after roughly a year and a half on the island, Baroness Eloise Wagner de Bosquet and her lover Robert Philipson vanished. Lorenz then asked Friedrich and Dora if they wanted to buy anything from the hacienda as he needed money to finally leave the island. And it's not as if the story itself is too weird. I mean, maybe except for the part about there being visitors at the hacienda? Yeah, I truly doubt that anybody could anchor there without anybody else on the island noticing, especially yeah. in that situation where they're all waiting for ships to come. Exactly. Know? How else are you going to get your lamp oil and chocolate, right? I mean, <laughs> you are keeping an eye out for those ships. But what seemed so weird to Dora was how rehearsed the story sounded. Buddy, are you going to... He's really chomping loudly. Sorry. <laughs> But then on inspection, the hacienda was indeed empty. Eloise and Robert were nowhere to be found, but all of the belongings of Eloise and Robert were still there. It seems as though they hadn't taken anything at all. And there was stuff that surely the Baroness would have never left behind. Yeah, there was, for example, a copy of uh, the picture of Dorian Gray. And this book was kind of her lucky charm, and she took it everywhere. What an odd lucky charm. <laughs> a picture of Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. Well... Yeah. yeah, she was an odd woman. I mean... There was just no way that she would have left the island and leaving that book behind voluntarily. And when Dora visited the Wittmer house, she could see a beautiful and very unique pink tablecloth and she was certain that she had seen it before in the Hacienda Paradiso. So how did the tablecloth get there so soon after the disappearance of the <laughs> Baroness, no? It was just all really, really weird and nothing did add up. Friedrich started at once to go through Eloise's belonging and take what he wanted because it's Friedrich, yeah. And this now confused Margaret Wittmer because she states in her book, why was he so sure that Eloise was not coming back, you know? 
Yeah. So it looks like everybody was suspecting everybody of doing something horrible to Eloise and Robert. Dora thought that Rudolf and Heinz had killed the Baroness and that Margaret knew it and helped to cover it up. And Margaret, on the other hand, was convinced that Friedrich and Lorenz were the culprits. Yeah, but I mean, that's because every single person on Floriana had a motive to kill Eloise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever happened, the two missing people are never seen or heard of again. And weeks and months pass and still no ship has come to Floriana, but at least the drought has ended and the rain has returned to the islands. Rudolf Lorenz is growing more and more desperate to leave Floriana. He wants to return to Germany and he has even pinned a note uh, on the barrel in post office bay stating that he is looking for a ship to take him off the island, just in case he misses one approaching the shore. But then... Finally, in July, a boat from Santa Cruz arrived. It belonged to a Norwegian settler named Nugarud. On board was also the ship's boy, 12-year-old José Passomino, and they came to the island with a journalist who wanted to visit the Empress of Floriana. But of course, the Baroness was gone, and the witness told the journalist everything they knew. The journalist verdict, this story doesn't add up. But he made the story of the disappearance known worldwide. The whole story became so famous that in 1938, the US President Franklin D. Roosevelt traveled to Floriana to question the witness about what had happened. Many authors wrote articles and stories about the Galapagos affair, among them even Georges Simenon. But we are not completely done yet. We still need to tell you Rudolf's story. So Rudolf Lawrence left the island with Nugarud's boat. And on their way to Santa Cruz, they passed a bigger ship heading for San Cristobal. And once Nugarud had reached Santa Cruz, Rudolf begged him to take him immediately to San Cristobal so that he could still catch the ship and leave for Guayaquil. Nugarud didn't want to because it was rough sea that day and it was also Friday the 13th. So that's altogether not the best conditions <laughs> for the trip. But Rudolf kept insisting and offered more money. He wanted to leave Galapagos as soon as possible. So Nugarut gave in and off they went. Nugarut, José and Rudolf. But unfortunately, they never made it to San Cristobal. Boats kept searching for the three men. Everybody hoped that they just had stranded on another island. But Nugarut's boat and the three men could not be found. But then, end of November 1934, two mummified bodies were found on the shore of Machena Island next to an overturned dinghy. And once more, George Allen Hancock makes an appearance in this story because he was called to identify the bodies, which is a bit weird <laughs> because surely there were others to do that. I think it was more of a personal interest to Captain Hancock, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it was the holiday season, so the crew brought a couple of their wives and off they went to Marchena Island. And Marchena is straight up south of Floriana and Santa Cruz and it's uninhabited. There are no natural predators there, but also no freshwater spring. And indeed, the two mummified bodies were those of Nugarud and Rudolf. They had somehow ended up on the boat's dinghy and got stranded on Marchena, where they probably died of thirst. But thanks to Captain Hancock, there is video material of the two bodies. It's not pretty. No. Nugarud's boat and the ship boy Jose were never found. But it's not over yet, because we have to tell you what happened to the other people living on Floriana. So the drought had passed and the rain had come, but it was too late for the crops in Frido, and there was not much left to harvest for Friedrich and Dora. They were running out of supplies. Dora and Friedrich kept fighting violently, even though Dory had stated in her book, Satan Came to Eden, that their time together was very harmonic and tender, I'm sure. Opus, that's really loud, buddy. And then Dora managed to kill their chickens by feeding them rotten pork. So now they also had no more eggs. And because food was scarce, Dora and Friedrich decided to eat the chicken. They even offered some to the Whitmers, but they said, thanks. But no thanks. Dora and Friedrich wanted to eat that meat. They thought they had been very careful, cooking it long enough so that all of the poison was already gone. But after taking just one bite, sorry, do you think they, like, pass the dentures back and forth? Like, you take a bite, then I take a bite? You know what I read? That uh, Friedrich never used the dentures for chewing, only for special occasions. What? <laughs> like, when he needed a pretty <laughs> smile, I guess. I can't, I cannot, <laughs> special occasion, your special occasion teeth. And I think that's why in the German sources it all states that it's just alleged that they shared the dentures because he was so, they were so precious to him. They were just for really special occasions, I guess, when they were, for example, invited to the Valero. Okay, oh. I love it. All right, so, so they poisoned the chicken with the rotten meat. And then they ate the poison chicken. And they thought everything would be fine. Which, 
I mean, even just saying that sentence, you know it's not going to be fine. (laughs) And after taking just one bite, Friedrich became violently sick. Dora showed no signs of poisoning, even though she ate way more of the chicken than the doctor. He was very clearly about to die. After waiting for a long time, during which Dora read Nietzsche to him... (laughs) Dora went over to the Whitmer's house to get some help. Now, we have two very different accounts of what happened. First, we have Dora's. Her story of how Friedrich died is very idyllic. So, he stretched his arms out and looked completely calm. And the way Margaret tells this event is... It's just a little bit different. When Margaret arrived at Frido, Friedrich was very clearly in a lot of pain, but he had managed to make a snarky remark about how ironic it was that he, a vegetarian, was dying of meat poisoning. <laughs> This fucking guy. (laughs) Then he reached for a pen and paper and wrote his last words while glaring with hate at Dora. And he wrote, I curse you with my dying breath. Promise me you'll put that on my tombstone. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's a good one. So Friedrich Ritter died on the 21st of November, 1934, and he is buried on his former property on Floriana. Soon after, Dora Strauch returned to Germany, and guess who took her off the island? (laughs) Of course, it was George Allen Hancock. In 1935, she published a book, Satan Came to Eden, written by a ghostwriter, and the book was, curiously enough, never published in German. And it's super fascinating to compare her book to Margaret Wittmer's book, because it's the same story from these two completely different perspectives. It's a typical, unreliable narrator situation, which I love. We are just left with a riddle of what is fact and what is fiction. Yeah. Yeah. Dora died in 1943. I read one account. It was due to complications of uh, MS and another one said uh, because of heart failure. So I don't know. So that left the Whitmers. They stayed on Floriana. A second child, Floriana Ingeborg, also called Florianita, was born in 1937. Harry Whitmer drowned in 1951 during a boating accident. In 1962, Margaret's sister Johanna moved to Floriana, where she died in 1981. Heinz Whitmer died in 1963. Rolf Whitmer, the first settler born on Floriana, at least historically documented, died in 2011. He had five children who went on to have children... Who had children, so most of them, they worked and still work in the family business founded by their father Rolf. There is also the Wittmer Lodge run by Florianita Wittmer and her offspring. I think Margaret Wittmer died in 2001. I think that's correct. For around $50, you can spend a night at the Wittmer Lodge and even get some homemade food. Mm -hmm. But please do us a favor, if you go there, don't bother the family with questions about what happened back then. Just read the book, okay? (laughs) Today, there are around 100 people living on Floriana. So that's it. (laughs) We told you everything we know about the mysterious and pretty bonkers Galapagos affair. What do we think? What happened? I think that Lorenz murdered Eloise and Robert and that Heinz and Margaret felt bad for him and helped to cover it up. And probably they also felt kind of relieved that she was gone. Yeah. I think their bodies are buried on the island. As for Friedrich, I think it's possible that Dora poisoned him. Maybe not even on purpose. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think Dora did poison him on purpose. I think <laughs> I think she poisoned him intentionally and then read Nietzsche to him while he died. Did she use his dentures while reading? <laughs> yeah, I bet she snapped him right in and made a lot of clicking noises with them while she read him Nietzsche too. She's just, <laughs> he was just a monster. I mean, I, I think this is the first time I'm sort of making fun of the death of somebody in a in an episode, but God, that guy was insufferable. I think he, I think because he was in World War One, no, as a soldier, I think his family say that that changed him a lot mentally, oh. which I get, you know, that happens. Yeah. But he was, he was not the nicest guy. Yeah. No. I mean, in the end, I felt a little bit bad for him. I have to admit. Yeah. I think you know more about his past than I do, but Dora had spent, I don't know, I think she killed him. Like, she had spent a long time on that island with no teeth to call her own, and I think she was just salty. Like, I think she had just had it. And I think either Lorenz did it, and the Whitmers felt bad and also relieved she was dead, or Mm. I would wonder also, maybe the Whitmers helped Lorenz. Like, maybe... Yeah. You it's know, also possible. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they work together to just sort out the situation. I mean, as you said before, every single one has motive to kill them. 
Yeah. Every single one. Yeah. And they have to be on the island because how would they have gotten the bodies off? Like they would have had to go some distance or the bodies would probably be washed back up on shore, right? So if their bodies never turned back up in Floriana, then... There is a book, I forgot the author, it's called The Galapagos Affair, and there is the theory that they fed the bodies to the sharks surrounding the island because they would come very close to the beach. Mm. Yeah, that's true. It's possible. Yeah. It's possible. I think they're buried, though. I do think they're buried. I think they're buried, yeah. 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 It's just such a strange... How do all of these people end up... Well, because it ended up in the media, right? So then you think that it's the fashionable thing to do, but... I think it takes a very special kind of person to do that. You have to be... If you decide to move to an island where only a handful of people live, you have to be the kind of person who's not really great... To live in a community with. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. You have to be very stubborn, very strong-willed, in my opinion, mm-hmm. because you don't normally do that. No, that's right. I agree. And that's why I think there's often so much problems in these small communities. Mm-hmm. Yep. Like holding a crutch. Yep. 100% that's I think a that's, thing. Yeah. I think that's that's why, because you have to be so strong-willed to live in that environment. It's that true. It's, yeah. Yeah. No, that's true. I would never. I would never. I just, no thanks. I'm all set. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Let's talk about, real quick, how is Jam? Is he still, is he out of his onesie? Yeah, yeah, he's good. He had his stitches removed. He was such a good boy the whole week, but then when the stitches got removed, he really freaked out and we have to hold him. Oh, baby. Yeah. Yeah. But he's good. Good. Everything else is fine. How's Opus? He's good. Hopefully you didn't hear him chomping too loudly in here with his toys, but he's good. And this weekend, I was laughing with Paul. We had a bank holiday weekend, a long weekend here. And so Opus had doggy playdates every day. Uh, So he was hanging out with Dottie the bulldog and our friends, friends of ours just got this little, she's the tiny, she looks like a baby Ewok. She's, you can (laughs) hold her with one hand and she's just a little pile of floof and teeth and she's adorable harley and uh and then his brother uh opus's brother gordo came over yesterday and uh the two of them were just i've never seen opus so excited he definitely recognized his brother so that was really cute oh that's so cute it was good yeah so what was your something good this week my something good is i ordered lots of fabrics online because somehow i got obsessed by the idea of learning how to quilt Mm mm-hmm I've been there. So that's not a really thing here, the the quilting. But, you know, you always see... Like, I, I love the Waltons and they sit together and do all this kind of hand-stitched quilt, which is not what I'm going to do. But I, I'm kind of obsessed by the idea of making a quilt for winter. So that's what, that's my something good. Please pray for me. I'm, I'm trying to make a quilt. I have a whole <laughs> bunch of quilting pattern books I should send to you because yeah. I also decided <laughs> that I wanted to learn how to quilt, but like 10, no, 15 years ago. And... um I made I made w- one tiny quilt, but it's something I keep meaning to do, and and I just haven't. I I know the basics of sewing, like I learned it in school. Yeah, we have like four or five years of like this kind of. The girls have to do crafting, and the boys have to work with tools, mm. which is such nonsense. I would have preferred <laughs> to learn how to use tools, but okay. So I had to go through all the sewing and and knitting and blah, and I hated it. I hated it so much, like oh. I despised it, and now. I don't know if it's the age or, so, I don't know, something happened and now I'm watching like knitting and crochet videos yeah. and want to make a quilt and, yeah, embroideries. I really want to start doing embroidery too. Yeah, I know. No, it's, and my knitting, I haven't picked up knitting in forever. Uh, I'm really far behind and my friend Amy just gave me a Schitt's Creek themed like little yarn thing. So I'm like, oh, I need to start. Start knitting again. Um, my something yeah. good this week is when we mentioned the really young mayor in the story earlier on, it made me think mm-hmm. of um, Parks and Rec. Did you ever watch Parks and Rec? Well, I watched a couple of episodes, but Philip loves it. It's, he loves it. It's so funny. It's another one like The Office where like the first season, they iron out some like rough bits kind of, and it finds its groove. And it's just, it's absolutely, it's hilarious. It's just another really funny half hour. And if you've ever worked for like local government, you'll, you'll definitely, (laughs) you'll definitely, I, I quote it a lot. So I think you guys will like it. Yeah. Thanks so much for listening. 
to another episode of Fresh Hell. And Johanna, it's your turn to beg for reviews. Yes, please do us a huge favor. If you're listening on iTunes and I think Stitcher, Stitcher or Spotify, I'm not 100% sure, but for certain, if you're listening on iTunes, you can go and leave us a rating and review. If you do that, that helps us out so much, really, because um, the more people review you, the more likely it is that we get recommended to other people who might be interested in listening to our little show here and it helps us grow. So that would be super. It really would thank be. You. Yeah, thank you. And if you can't leave a review, if you just tell a friend <laughs> and you can join the Facebook group, which has lots of pictures of Opus, <laughs> but it's also, I think I made at least one private joke in this episode based on stuff we've chatted about in the Facebook group. <laughs> so it's... Yeah, we're very chatty there. It's yeah. very, it's just a fun, it's a fun corner of the interwebs and it's enjoyable. Please tell your dogs and axolotls and wallabies and squirrels and all the other amazing pets you have. Hi. We love them. We miss them. Give them a hug. We miss you. We love you. Definitely. And if you yourself are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.